But these were the first cultural photos I ever took. And I love the connection to photograph people that won't even acknowledge that they're being photographed. They've never been photographed. So you get behind a little box and they just look at you without any kind of reaction, which told me they have never been photographed. And I was absolutely transfixed. I knew this is what I really would want to do. It was really at the right time of my life. I was in Bhutan a couple of years ago at a hotel, and there was this big poster of a Chinese city. But I did not recognize it. And I asked somebody at the lobby, where's that photo from? And they said, oh, that's Lhasa. It's like you wouldn't even recognize Lhasa from 1984 to what it looks like now. You know, the Chinese have moved in. Tibet's a lost cause. As you remember, there was such an effort to try to free Tibet, but that's never going to happen. But this Patala Palace, which is the heart of the Buddhist faith, is surrounded by high rises. So it only reemphasized to me that the mission of recording cultures that may not survive into the future, there's a value to that, to have a record of what was once. When I came back from Everest, a couple of us stopped in eastern China because I had become fast friends with our Chinese interpreter who himself was a painter. So we stopped with him in Huanshan in eastern China. The rest of the expedition went on home. I had been on an ice cube for three months. It's blue sky, it's gray rock, it's cold. And suddenly in Huanshan, eastern China, it was like walking into a giant watercolor painting. And in the years prior that I studied a lot of art history, I always looked at the Chinese masters when we studied that period that, all right, these guys are obviously high on opium because they're manufacturing an artificial landscape. And then I went to Huanshan and I realized they were much more literal in what they depicted. So I came home from Everest the following year, bought a house. And in fact, I was painting the house with the fence with Robert up on 106th. And some guy was taking down a sign on a house across the street. And he flippantly said to me, when am I going to sell your house for you? And I just as flippantly said, the day you find me an old house in West Seattle with a great view of the water and lots of trees. He said, oh my god, I got the perfect house for you. I said, look, I'm not really interested. I love my little house. He said, it's five minutes away. And I said to Robert, just stay here. I'll be back in five minutes. And in rude, he goes, what do you do? I mean, what do you mean, what do I do? I'm a photographer. And he says, oh, weddings? I said, no. <laughs> What's your subject? I said, nature. Oh, National Geographic? I said, on occasion. He said, OK, don't tell me anymore. So we went up to this house. And he pulled into this house. And I said, where the hell is the house? It was literally covered in English ivy. You could not see the house. Not only was the house covered in English ivy, but all the trees on the hillside were covered in English ivy. The only part of the house you could see is where the windows were. This is why the house had been on the market for two years. Nobody wants to buy a house they cannot see. But I did. Because when I walked up this steep grassy yard, there was a view of the water. And there was a lot of trees. So I said, there's no way I can afford this view. I didn't even refer to the house. I couldn't see. And we knocked on the door. An older lady answered. And this guy said, I want to introduce you to a National Geographic photographer. I love National Geographic. <laughs> so the man asked her, this is five minutes after I met this guy. This man is willing to offer you $190,000, and your house is listed for two hundred thirty, dollars right? Yes. He would offer you $190,000, and he didn't even ask me. <laughs> My house that I was living in was like $49,000. And she goes, well, I'll take that. And he looks at me, and I go, all right. And that was it. That was it. That was the second house I ever bought. It took me 11 months to qualify for a loan. Months after I moved in, I started hiring the largest mobile crane in the city, selling construction. What year? This was 1986. Because it took me 11 months 
to qualify for the loan. And as soon as I got it, I got the crane. And so there's a story behind all of this, is I was going to create a mini Huan Shan. I was so impressed with this Chinese landscape of vertical granite, twisted pine trees, moss and ferns that I thought, I'm going to transform this grassy yard into a mini Huan Shan. And in fact, that's what I've done. This is now 30 years after I started. And my belief is that the division between sanity and insanity is often crossed by us. You know, somebody cuts you off or you just blow it and you get yelled. You know, so I'm very protective of my psychology. I don't expose myself to a lot of negative people, nor ideas, nor any of it. So I spend an inordinate amount of time strapped to plane seats, as I did yesterday. And when I'm home, I'm in the garden for the first day. I filled the garden with things that I would naturally seek out as a photographer. Patterns, textures, shapes, things that I learned in design class at the University of Washington. Fortunately, there was a slope to the garden, so that meant I could put in a water feature. So we took, I, I and a, a person I had just taught a class to was an architect. So between he and I, we took a backhoe and carved out a stream bed. And over the years, I've filled the garden with things that I love, you know, natural elements. So virtually every part of the garden is uplifting and positive by choice, by intention. I travel now well over three-fourths of the year. In a week's time, I'll go to India and then Japan. And so it requires to be operating on a high level of energy and positive energy. So this is the garden. It used to be a flat, muddy, grassy yard. And from in this old house, every view is out to the garden or to the water, or my neighbor's garden, which is amazing. <laughs> what I didn't know and what I did not expect is the water runs on a recycled basis and it attracts all the creatures. My, uh, a coyote killed your cat on my porch? Yeah. I've had a red fox in the garden, eagles, owls, water attracts animals. I put in very expensive koi. I didn't ever buy. I never expend, uh, spend money on the koi. I always traded photographs to people that dealt with koi. So I filled the garden with koi. And the raccoons, the herons, ate the koi. So I put in an electrical peripheral, or a fence, barrier, and put even more expensive, like $900 koi. And I believe river otters ate the second batch. <laughs> A hummingbird nested in one of the pines this year. I have pines and I work in the pines for two weeks and this gentleman here walks by every day and I'm always compulsively working and you're always saying, why are you working so hard? Yeah. We won't talk about the blower, okay? Just. So, yeah, it was so rewarding to have a hummingbird in my uh, bonsai, bonsai trees. I put it in a bird box below the kitchen and I got a family of screech owls. So it's such a, you know, at the, at the time, you know, I, I, I told you I didn't deliberate very long to buy my house. But at one point in the future, I thought someday I'm going to move. And I could have had the choice of moved, uh, moving out into the foothills and being surrounded by forests and died every month that a new development comes in or stay in the city and plant a forest. So I have planted well over 300 coniferous trees on the slopes around my house. I've put in over 1,000 sword fern. I've got hemlock, cedar, Douglas fir. I have made an environment rich for wildlife. The barred owl comes in, and he looks at the... When I replace the koi with $1 goldfish, <laughs> Nothing eats $1 goldfish. <laughs> the barred owl doesn't eat fish, but he loves to look at the movement at night. A sharp shinned hawk comes every other day to take a bath. 
So pileated woodpeckers, virtually every animal that we know of in western Washington has been through the garden. So the old house was beautiful once I birthed it from the ivy. I eradicated the ivy on the house and on all the subsequent trees, but it took years. Now I'm working on the wild clematis. But that's the view. And when I walked up that place and saw the view, it didn't matter what the house looked like. I would have been happy to pitch a tent. And you walk over a little uh, stoneway over the koi pond to the house. I tore up the red shag carpet, the velvet wallpaper, the <laughs> I'm looking around, making sure I don't really piss anybody <laughs> off. The wrought iron chandeliers. And underneath the carpets were floors very similar to this. Siberian oak was brought in at the turn of the century. So many of the old homes up on Capitol Hill and in West Seattle are uh, wood from Siberia. I put a deck around the old house. This is clinker brick. I'm not trying to boast about this house. I know it sounds funny, but what I'm trying to say is through sweat equity more than money, I transformed this house. It's the work that went in, the labor of love. But also, if you're going to be an artist, you should live like an artist, right? So it's a great old house with hand-hewn cedar beams. And... I filled it with things I've collected, inexpensive art that I've collected throughout the world, some expensive art, but baskets and tapestries and wood carvings from Africa to New Guinea. I keep the house really open like this house is because I open it up to gay rights organizations, to political parties, to elephant orphanages from East Africa. Any group that I would support, I make the house available to them because I like sharing this great old house. When I sit up in bed, my view is to the west. So West Seattle, look how green it is, is the place that draws me back and back and back again. And Lincoln Park is where a lot of my natural history and growing up was centric. Because I just grew up right on the hill in on the border of Fauntroy and Arbor Heights. I photographed with my father's old camera in the late 70s a view down this row of uh, Madronas in Lincoln Park. But that negative disappeared, <laughs> just like that moose shot uh, disappeared. So I went back and back, and I, I was amazed at how fast Salau grows and things really change. And I kept going back to this place over the years, but it'll never be what it was when I first photographed it, but that's all right. It served me well over the years. I go up to Smith's Park. Smith's Park is, I think, a hidden jewel of this city, and so many people don't know it's there. Great old trees. So I love going in there. The ravine below my house, um, we, in, we got the kids in the grade school, Gatewood, Denny Junior High and South High School to all come in and work together on different levels to plant cedar trees and restore the forest. The city bought this as a green belt and may have been under your, I think it was under your period of time. Now I'm, a, I'm forgetting this lady. Winnie, um, she won a Nobel Prize. Does anybody remember this lady's name? Nobody. Okay. I can make it up then. She won a Nobel Prize simply because she planted over two million trees in Kenya. And that's why she got a Nobel Prize. So she came and gave a talk at Benaroya, and we got her out to our little ravine below our house, and she taught the kids how to plant trees. So I'm just going to really go quickly now <laughs> through some of my favorite uh, projects. And because I believe most of you are receiving a book, Earth is My Witness, which just came out in October. By the way, that book is out of print already, and they're reprinting it. And then we just found out that the Germans, the French, Chinese for the first time, and Spanish are uh, bringing it out in their languages. 
So I've traveled and had dream projects. You know, I've traveled the world for a book called Edge of the Earth, Corner of the Sky. And for that book, I was, it was a dream project to go to the most beautiful landscapes on the planet and capture them in stunning light. I came home from Bolivia one year, turned on CNN, and they were reporting a great tragedy that Mount Etna was once again erupting and a river of lava was heading down to a mountain village. And it was whole about destroy, you know, destru death and destruction. And within 48 hours, I was on the summit. I called up a friend that was in Marseille. He drove down to Rome, picked me up at the airport. We got up on top of Mount Etna while it was still erupting. 10,000 feet. But it did occur to me that if you build a village on the most active volcano on the planet, <laughs> won't you consider or entertain the fact that one day maybe a river of lava is going to come in your backyard? <laughs> so yeah, volcanoes. Uh, one year I went into K2 up in the Karakoram Range of Pakistan. Any place on the earth, because as I said earlier, I studied the maps. I, w I know the earth. You can point to any place on the globe and I'll, at a certain level and I'll tell you what's there. So I have been fortunate to have had the drive, the health, and the curiosity. And the camera has become a passport to the world as it continues to be. As it will continue until I'm too old to travel. Somewhere mid-June, I'm speculating. <laughs> I did a TV show called Travels to the Edge that now airs in 70 countries around the world. So invitations from Oman and other countries I've never been to come and tell their story. So there's a good chance I'll get that show back up and running. But it will even be a better show because for the last year, a team of photographers uh, from Sydney have been traveling with me from Africa to New Guinea to Alaska, and they've produced an amazing uh, one-hour documentary. And it's first going to air in Australia, and then I'll get it onto PBS. But I also will go and parlay that into sponsorship to do a 10-part or a 13-part series. So Namibia, all those places, you know, all the places around the world. On any calendar year, I'm likely to have been to all seven continents. Three times to Africa last year. There will be two trips to Africa this year. Um, from Cappadocia in Turkey. I did a book called Tribes. And it was a celebration of how indigenous cultures in remote areas are very clever on how they adorn themselves during ceremonial occasions. So from Southeast Asia to New, New Zealand, New Guinea, Africa, the Amazon, I went for that book. And it was really straight in your face kind of portraits so that as you look into the faces of these people, they're looking straight into your eyes. So that emotional connection that I felt at the time I took the picture would be transformed onto the audience. And again, as I said earlier, cultures that are changing. You know, all the old men in the Kaibo tribe in Brazil still were wearing wooden discs to make themselves look grotesque and fearsome because these are hunter and gatherers and they war with tribes over the next ridge. But the young men in the village no longer are doing that. If you live in an area where there's spotted cats like leopards or cheetahs, you're likely to adorn yourself with spots. Humans are very, very uh, wired the same way. That's what I've found in all the years I've traveled. A book called The Living Wild was about habitat and the need to preserve more habitat. So I asked Jane Goodall to write original text for it. Um, William Conway, who was the director general of the Wildlife Conservation Society. John Sawhill, who started the Nature Conservancy. Richard Dawkins out of Oxford University. And finally, George Schaller, who did all the pioneering research on snow leopards and jaguars, wrote original text for this book. And for my side, I just traveled again around the world, shooting with a wide angle perspective, getting close, too close at times to animals to try to portray them in their environment. One of the singular stupidest things I've ever done. 
So wide angle perspectives, giving a sense of place to the animals, because it was really about habitat. And the mantra when I would travel the country and talk about the book was, an animal without proper habitat is biding time to extinction. So a great book. I do lead photo workshops. And one of the places I love to take people is up to Katmai National Park. And if you've read Alaska Bear Tales, you won't go into the forest. You're so frightened of bears, bears. And after seven days with me, you get so nonchalant, you can be in amongst 13 or 14 bears, and you can comfortably eat your lunch with your back turned to a bear that's maybe 14 feet away. It's very empowering. Now, I lose a couple clients every year. No. <laughs> First day out of the den, a mother is bringing her three. This is where I was just in the last week. A baby Waddell sea, seal, king penguins on South Georgia Island, emperor penguins. I was on the first exploratory trip. There was five of us to go and look for emperor penguins on the Waddell Sea. And it took 11 days waiting in Punta Arenas, which is the most southern city on the planet. And then we flew out. And it took three days by plane to get out to this frozen sea. But the light came out. The emperor penguins, they're 90-pound birds. They're about that big. Amazing birds. They raise one chick. This is early in November. And the light is golden at around 2 in the morning. So I was, again, fortunate to be in West Seattle, fortunate to be in Seattle, because the first company in America that would uh, take tourism to Antarctica was based out of Seattle, Society Expeditions. And right out of college, I talked my way onto one of those boats. You give me a free passage, I'll give you all the photos I take. And that began a 20-year trip, a relationship with these companies. I think this photo is a great metaphor for uh, changes, for disappearing ice. You know, a lot of the big shelves of ice in Antarctica are breaking off, floating north, and melting. That's a cheery thought, isn't it? Migrations was a uh, look at patterns, kind of inspired by M.C. Escher. So a lot of aerial work from ultralights in Africa. So every book that I did or have done would have a unique point of view. Photos like this would not necessarily appear in the living wild, but for migrations, yeah. And yet another way of looking at wildlife, camouflage, vanishing act, you know, showing how animals evolve into their environment. Eat or be eaten. So animals just disappear right in front of you. Do you see it? Because I try to use every device I could to hide the animal from you. Yeah, scale. In this case, scale throws you off because you think there's something right in here. What are we looking at here? Oh, you're a sharp-eyed leopard. Just sitting right there. So that was a fun book. It only took nine years to do. Nine years, because you've got to have at least 100 photos in the book that really exhibit vanishing. There's a wolf in the shot looking at you. But those white trees distract you. Oh, you people are so simple. Bright, shiny objects attract your attention. See it? OK. So the book that I think are, is everybody getting this book? This is clearly the best book of my life. No, I mean, look at it. It's 
It's eight pounds. It's 500 photos. It looks back over 40 years. I've done 80 books. I've worked on 80 books, from children's books to foreign imprints. This is clearing away the best book of my life. And it was awarded the best photo book of the year by American Photo Magazine. Oprah named it her ten fa one of her 10 favorite books for 2014. So it looks at the genres, you know, from cultures to wildlife to landscapes. A publisher in San Rafael came to me and says, I want to do your opus. And I said, great, what the hell is an opus? I don't know what an opus is. He says, well, it's not a retrospective. I said, that's good because I'm still kind of viable. I'm still shooting. So he said, well, let's say it'll be the best work to this point in your life. I said, I can go with that. And so having a background in painting and design, I gave myself permission to orchestrate some of the shots. You know, these are monks at a monastery outside of Kathmandu, Nepal, but they would not normally sit this close. But I wanted to turn it into like something that was akin to a dahlia flower. I wanted to challenge perceptions. So I went to the head lama at the monastery and I said, what would it take to take 60 monks and put them in a position uh, that I want to photograph them? He goes, well, you see those dingy brown hats that they're wearing? I said, yeah. He said, well, a new hat costs about three bucks. I said, how many monks, 60? I did the math and bought them all hats and they were so happy to do whatever I asked. <laughs> so if you're familiar with the work of Andy Goldworthy, the Scott artist that takes clay, rock, ice, leaves, and makes artwork out of it, I'm essentially doing the same, but with real people, real cultures in their environment, but I'm just changing it and making it a little more abstract. Women in Rajasthan, India. If you have $7 in India, you can make anything happen. So I drew a picture of what I wanted, climbed a banyan tree in Jayapur, India, and had these mahouts or elephant drivers come in and create this pattern below me. In Bali, uh, Kesak performers. For the book, there's also uh, candid shots. In Okayama, Japan, in the middle of the winter, 3,000 drunken, loincloth-wearing men are vying for a wooden phallus in the middle of the night. Now, I like, I'm not particularly religious. I have no affiliation. But I sh photograph so much religion in every year because religions um, allow cultures to retain their traditions, which is exactly what I'm about. So Buddhists and Muslim and Hindu and you know, all the religions and all the quirky little ones, you know, the shaman, the voodoo, all those are things I'm naturally attracted to. But I'd have to say the Buddhists are the easiest. They're so easy to photograph. Because you ask if you can photograph them, and they go, uh-huh. Nobody ever de uh, denies us. To be able to go into a monastery in Bhutan, in the heart of the Himalayas, and photograph an ancient and timeless tradition, what a privilege that is. That's a great privilege. So yeah, Earth as my witness looks on a broad brush stroke of the Earth. Not just cultures, but wildlife and landscapes as well. It should be comforting to know that in the age of modern technology, that every day there's caravans of camels coming out of the heart of the Amazon, or uh, Sahara, laden with salt on their way south to Timbuktu or north to Morocco. So these traditions are still there. In the mountains of Morocco, in the Atlas Mountains, Berbers, uh, tribesmen, play a game called Fantasia, where the whole game is you try to fire all these multiple muskets, ancient rifles, to sound like the crack of one going off. And if they can achieve that, they win this game. Out in Rajasthan, women that are carrying vessels on their head to go fetch water, I've paused to look like a Martian landscape. Martians in a Martian landscape. In Western Mongolia, Kazakh people have taken a golden eagle as a chick out of a nest and trained it to hunt 
wolves and foxes in the middle of the winter. Can you believe a bird could take down a timber wolf? It can. I've been back to the tribes in the deserts of Ethiopia three or four times and photographed these guys' fathers. I've brought photos. This, these tribes know me now. They know me now. I brought the TV show there. And this adornment that I started with tribes, as you saw earlier, has evolved into a new body of work. So I brought the uh, Australian team there. And then I brought the guy that actually wrote Photoshop. His name is Thomas Knoll. And he came and he funded the trip. And I brought photos and using an interpreter, I started doing the same thing that I was doing with the other tribes or the monks and creating these abstract patterns. They have never been photographed like this before. But they were willing and able because I showed them the computer of what I was doing with other people. I call this a cubist, Picasso-inspired. So this then led to a body of work in Seattle called the Human Canvas. And that's what I'm going to end with, a few photos from the Human Canvas. But the idea started in Africa, where I would paint people into place. Sound familiar? It looks like camouflage, right? So I would do these big. Uh, canvases on the floor of my home in West Seattle, maybe two or three days creating these patterns. I would bring in individuals and paint them into the backdrop. These are large format cameras, so this could go 10 by 12 feet. So tribal designs was part of the human canvas. The idea was to photograph the human form without eliciting a sexual response or even sensual. It's more theatrical. So very elaborate backdrops. I would spray paint people white or black and then hand paint them within the context of the backdrops. And when people look at this work, they ask, did you create that digitally? I said, no. Every spot is hand painted. Getting back to my roots of being a painter, now I'm combining and creating a hybrid between photography and painting. One of the top performers at the North Pacific Northwest Ballet. I'm fascinated with calligraphy, so I would do this. Now, this is just a typical shoot. There was 27 individuals. Women were painted white for purity and men black for evil. That's a joke. At any rate, they had never heard of Escher, this Dutch artist that had inspired the book well, they're all 20 and 30 year olds. They don't have art history in their schools anymore. So we were creating a Escher-esque. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what was going on on First Avenue. <laughs> One day we were doing this and uh, a whole crew of firemen came in to do an inspection of my gallery, and they saw these naked people, and it took us a while to get them out. <laughs> so this is a body of work that I've produced a book from. Um, Leica out of Germany has just given me a $100,000 system to photograph more, which I'm doing on Saturday, and they're going to tour this work in Europe. And my whole idea is to have it as an installation that would travel. I learned how to clay people, to encase them with clay. So black individuals, the white clay, potter's clay that I get down by First Avenue, when it dries, it reveals their dark skin. And light-skinned individuals was the reverse. Before the clay set and dried, I would paint them in black tempera paint. And when it dried, it revealed their white skin. So the idea was to show humans almost as we're coming out of the earth in a very uh, kind of gritty way. But since I know a lot about art history, a lot of the artists like Keith Haring, jo Jackson Pollock, Matisse, informed the work and gave me a lot of inspiration. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh my God, it's 10 to 11. Art, Art thank you so much for this presentation tonight. Um, you all enjoyed this, I'm sure. Um, we're, we're getting to the point where we need to move to the next part of this. Maybe we could take one question, if there's a burning one. But before we do that, um, I not only want to thank Art Wolf, but I also assume that all of you have enjoyed this wonderful setting. Could you please give a round of applause to our hosts, Marianne and David. Thank you so much for making this available. We couldn't have done it without you. You know, I feel like I was born with cedar scent in my veins. You know, everything that represents the Northwest, everything that represents Seattle is so true to who I am. There's no question that I would live here the rest of my life. I live one and a half miles from where I was born and one mile from where I grew up. So my roots are strong and uh, unwavering.